he's towering over me and instinctively I know I'm in danger. I'm a nine-year-old kid and he's a very big man. He'd said he was a police officer and so I presume he's forcefully taking my hand because we're gonna go do a good deed, right? Why is he taking me underground when no one can see us out of sight? What if I told you that I believe my resilience and passion for the arts saved my life? That with each traumatic event in my childhood, being abducted and raped, the molestation, my parents' divorce, living in poverty in the South Bronx, the drug dealers in my family, my father's choice to give me up for adoption, my stepfather's abuse of my mother, and all the violence I saw, that artistic outlets and my resilience helped me cope. Just a couple of months ago, there I was watching a documentary called Resilience, reporting that doctors had discovered a strong correlation between one's level of childhood trauma and the likelihood that we may die up to 20 years younger because of it. The adverse childhood experiences test ACEs, they call it. I'm sitting there blindsided by this news, thinking, Wait, what? I've done my best to overcome my trauma and my PTSD diagnosis, and that may still not be enough. What more can I do? I'm sitting there, and of course, leaning, the learning of this information triggered my mind right back to all those times in my life when my trauma exposure was simply just too high. As a kid, coloring with crayons or playing with Play-Doh or color forms or my Etch-a-Sketch soothed me, distracting me long enough to endure the punches and plates being thrown around me way too often. Just when I thought my colorful toys were helping me extract myself from the chaos around me, I was violently sucked into a black and white horror film on that sunny day when the greasy stranger snatched me away in broad daylight. He said he was a police officer who needed my help finding an old lady's dog. And I remember my intuition frantically screaming inside of me, run, run, get away from him. But I couldn't because no adult had ever given me permission to disobey an elder. So instead, Dazed and shocked, I didn't resist him as the pedophile took my hand. My world in color was replaced by the dull sepia tones I saw in that filthy basement that my rapist had taken me to. And I know I'm lucky he let me go. But frankly, finding my way out of that cement maze afterwards that chilling experience haunts me to this day. How had I found my way home? Resilience, they say. Back at my apartment, I sat in despondent silence while the five, five adults I lived with didn't notice I was in triage mode right in front of them. Immediately, my brain switched over to a video surveillance camera forevermore monitoring my surroundings because the rapist said he'd come back to kill me if I ever told anyone. And now, as I sat there, mortally wounded by the adults I'd trusted to keep me safe and who had failed me, they too were now on my security monitor. In that moment, I made the conscious decision to begin my life as a sentry, on guard to protect me, because no one else would. Stuck in traumatized shock, I remember that Lightbright helped calm me down, and that the Instamatic camera I got when I was 10 helped me regain my focus by distracting me some. P 
piquing my curiosity instead about the world around me. I decided I loved art so much that I would apply to the High School of Art and Design in New York City. <laughs> Despite my compromised academic record and lack of self-confidence. I mean, really, how well can you perform in school when you're constantly on duty as your own security guard? At the time, I thought I was just a dumb, unmotivated Puerto Rican kid. I didn't understand that the childhood trauma I'd experienced would medically explain in today's world why I was unable to concentrate, memorize, or recall factual data with any consistency. But as a photography student in art school, I was good, and my teachers told me so. I then attended a great college for misfits like me, Emerson College in Boston, where I immersed myself in the study of interpersonal communications, in part trying to make sense of the severe family dysfunction I'd lived with my whole life. Basically, why pay for college tuition if it's not therapy too? I also studied the French Impressionism movement there, led by renegade painters like Renoir and Van Gogh, who challenged the social norms of their time, thereby inspiring me to question my status quo. Studying them and maverick photojournalists like Matthew Brady and Margaret Burke White taught me how a painting or a photograph can evoke a full range of emotions for the viewer. By this time, I understood that art was my religion and that photography was my denomination. After becoming the first college graduate in my family, I was outwardly managing my childhood trauma pretty well, I thought, presuming it was all in the past and that with some casual psychotherapy from time to time, I'd successfully gotten over it. I even achieved major corporate success as a company spokesperson. As I birthed each of my three masterpieces, my sons, they brought light back into my world and gave me the priceless gift of continued healing. And I had an amazing husband too. I indulged them, even the husband when he didn't feel like it, in every art form I could. While remaining the century, I was, but now as a parental one, filled with cautious but joyful optimism. Resilience, they say, is when you're determined to do better for future generations and thereby cathartically helping to heal your own past. And then that past came back to bite me as I watched my mother die when she was only 53. It wasn't just that she was leaving so soon. It was also that I'd never trusted her enough to tell her I'd been raped. Frankly, I'd never told anyone. I told one person when I was 21, and that was it, until after my mother died. Or that I'd never now have the chance to confront her about what she'd done to her own kids with scissors. My PTSD symptoms slowly began assaulting my amygdala around this time, setting off a cerebral ticking bomb that finally blew up in my face right after I'd been in New York City on 9-11, on lockdown, and all alone. That fateful night in the ER, I told them I thought I was having a severe allergic reaction or maybe an asthma attack, and they didn't question my self-diagnosis. Maybe they should have asked me, does anxiety run in your family? Had they done that, maybe they wouldn't have prescribed the high doses of a drug known to have psychotic side effects. And a lot of you are probably taking that same drug, so be careful. It took three doctors, medication, the con unconditional support of my immediate family and friends, prayer, and intensive counseling to stabilize me during the most frightening year of my life. Because when your amygdala is hurt, it can't filter out all of the trauma from the past. And so your trigger level is so high that 
going to the grocery store can be, you know, oh, those bananas, they remind me of when I was three and this happened. I remember obsessing with my doctors about my PTSD diagnosis and whether or not this meant I was crazy, like the toxic people in my life insinuated over and over again to this day. No, you're not crazy. Your amygdala has been injured, my doctor said. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being crazy because I think we all are in one way or another. <laughs> Resilience through education can make you fearless. Converting your trauma into the level of extraordinary bravery that Purple Hearts are awarded for, an acknowledgement of your wounds sustained in battle. With renewed determination to get my life back, my 35 millimeter BFF gave me the courage to return to the place where my rape had occurred and to photograph that basement. Honoring my inner child's quest to stare down that terrifying memory and also to grieve our loss of innocence. And by the way, I did that all alone, and my husband did not know I was trying to do that. I also summoned the courage to fly over Ground Zero in a helicopter to pay my respects to, and to photograph my hometown's resilience from above. I switched careers and surprised myself by becoming an award-winning photojournalist even after my PTSD diagnosis when I'd fretted that my work life was over. I also wrote and published my memoir because I needed to see my truth in print and to commune with my fellow victims of trauma. And that's when I launched my blog, NewYourEurekingGirl.com, so that people who have been where I have been can talk to me and know that there's life afterwards. This also led to my collaboration with the Latin Ballet of Virginia, bringing my book to life on stage. I was graced with the chance to forgive my parents as I saw them come back to life through the dancers, the beautiful music, and the audience applauding. Resilience is the ability to convert your wounds into empathy and then into action and advocacy, and that's why I'm here today. So back to that day when I was watching the documentary Resilience, I'll admit I was freaked out at first, worrying that I too would die too soon. Reminded about how my mom died at 53 and her siblings at 48 and 45 and 39 and my cousins too at 32 and at 30. You see the connection, right? Accepting I may die younger has changed the way I view my aging process now. I've made significant changes in my life, and ceremoniously, I'm letting myself go gray. <laughs> Lest I miss out on seeing myself as a senior citizen and taking full use of all of the discounts. <laughs> now that we have research proving one's childhood trauma is carried with them over a lifetime, and may medically cut their life short. What are we, what are you going to do about it? I encourage you to answer the call in helping us all better understand this urgent humanitarian crisis. So many people are in trauma. The life you save may be your own. My PTSD diagnosis was not a death sentence. It's actually given me the chance to live a better life. Working through my childhood trauma, optimizing my healing and my health. I realized my rape doesn't define me. My resilience does. And so does my art. Thank you.